Great, thank you. Actually, I'm curious, uh, how many of you actually have heard about Nomento or know of us before you came? Okay, great. Um, so you might uh, know that we've been working in uh, machine learning algorithms um, in terms of applications. We've been focusing on uh, streaming analytics, and we work with a number of customers in that area, and we've really been uh, focusing on anomaly detection within that field. Um, and when it came to kind of evaluating different anomaly detection algorithms, uh, we, we, came, we found that it was actually really hard to do that, and there weren't really good benchmarks for it. The field of machine learning is full of lots of good benchmarks, but in the world of uh, streaming anomaly detection, there seems to be um, very few, if not none. And so what we did is we created an open source benchmark for the community, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, so if you think about kind of the world of streaming analytics, um, as you all know, there's an exponential growth in the number of sensors with Internet of Things and real-time data collection. There's a very large set of uh, uh, explosion of data that's coming out. Um, there's not a lot of machine learning technologies actually focus in this. Most of the work has been on databases and visualizations and so on. But in the, uh, you know, in the realm of learning, uh, anomaly detection is um, one of the biggest applications, if not the biggest application, in, in streaming analytics. So you can think about uh, things like monitoring the health of your data center. You want to know when servers, you know, something going wrong with your servers. Uh, monitoring, you know, fraudulent transactions and, and streaming financial data. Uh, energy, uh, you know, strange things happening in energy. Uh, tracking a fleet of vehicles or, you know, even looking forward into real-time kind of health monitoring and trying to figure out when are you going to become sick or are you becoming sick right now in real time. One of the interesting things is that although we use the word anomaly detection, it's not really detection when you think about streaming analytics. It's more about prevention. You want to find, uh, you want to get, uh, understand when something unusual is going on before some sort of a catastrophic failure. You know, it's much more valuable to know to, that you're going to have a heart attack in three minutes than, oh, you're having a heart attack right now. Uh, that little bit of difference uh, makes a big difference. So let's look at an example. So this is a preventative maintenance scenario. So this is a very large industrial machine that's in some remote location. Um, and this is the temperature of one of their sensors. Um, and there's three different anomalies in here. If you look at the first one, the left one, well, that was a planned shutdown of the machine. So that's fine. If you look at the right-hand one, this was actually a catastrophic failure that cost this company millions of dollars because they didn't know about this in advance. Now, if you look at the middle one, um, that occurred several weeks before the catastrophic failure. It was actually a strange temporal uh, fluctuation uh, in the data, and an expert looking at that actually told us that that was the actual cause that then, several weeks later, led to the catastrophic failure. So if you could detect that um, you know, middle anomaly, it could have saved the company millions of dollars. Okay? So it's an example of why detecting something early is really valuable in, in streaming analytics. So, I mean, do we really need yet another benchmark? <laughs> well, you know, what is a benchmark? So a benchmark consists of, you know, labeled data sets, a, a well-thought-out scoring mechanism, and a versioning system, so you can compare different results. Um, it turns out that in most of the benchmarks in anomaly detection are really designed for batch data, not streaming data. The second thing, uh, we're, you know, practitioners in machine learning, you know, we really want real-world data, and it's extremely hard to find uh, benchmarks containing real-world data with labeled anomalies. And the combination of those two just doesn't exist. And so we saw a need for a benchmark that is really designed to test anomaly detection algorithms on real-time streaming data. And we felt that a standard community benchmark would really uh, spur innovation and really help the community there. Okay, so what did we do? So, so we created the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark, or NAB. Um, this is a rigorous benchmark for an anomaly detection in streaming applications, and there are three basic pieces to it. So first is we include a real-world benchmark data set. Um, there are about 300, over 350,000 individual data points. Um, there are 47 real-world data sets and 11 artificial streams. Um, there's a scoring mechanism, which I'll describe in a couple of minutes. So this scoring mechanism rewards early detection. Uh, it consists of uh, generous windows around an anomaly, so you have some slop in how you detect things. It's got a scoring function, and we have a notion of application profiles, which control kind of the, the balance between false positives and false negatives. So I'll, I'll talk about that. The second and the third thing is that it's a completely open resource. It's a GPL 
a repository that contains all of the data, all of the source code, the documentation, everything's up on that uh, GitHub uh, repository there. So here's some of the uh, example data sets that are in there. Uh, or, um, this particular one is uh, looking at the latency of load balancers on a website. So you can see that most of the time it's pretty low. Every once in a while you get spikes up um, and that's totally normal. This is a really unpredictable hard data set. And in the middle, or you know, the right hand side, there's an anomaly where the latencies ended up uh, being a lot higher than normal. Okay, so that's an example of, a, of an anomaly that you'd want to detect as soon as possible if you're doing a production website. Here's a very different example. It's hourly uh, demand from some service. In this particular case, it's uh, New York City taxi data. So this is counting how many taxi rides are going on every hour. Uh, and you can see it's got a very periodic um, shape to it, but there are some anomalies in there. So in the middle, uh, on the left-hand side, there's a spike in demand. That was actually the New York City Marathon. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you see a very different type of anomaly. You have unusually low uh, demand. Uh, so the, the values here are completely within range. A threshold wouldn't catch it. An outlier-based method probably wouldn't catch it. Uh, but it's, a, it's definitely an anomaly uh, that you want to go by. Here's a third example. And this is looking at the CPU usage on a production server. Um, the, the pattern is extremely spiky again. And in the beginning, it was uh, not very spiky. That was pretty low, and then it starts to spike. So there was a, 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 a kind of a new behavior that happened that was an anomaly. But then this behavior actually continues. So maybe some new software was installed, or a new, piece, new service was installed, or something. Um, and this, even though there was an anomaly there, this behavior is now the new normal. So you don't want to keep giving uh, false positives in there. You want to uh, adapt to the new normal. And then again, uh, in the middle, there's a spike anomaly. So uh, I've t you know, th those examples kind of show the range of anomalies that you tend to see in streaming data. And they're pretty complicated to score. So how should we score them? Well, let's define what we mean by an ideal detector. So the perfect detector here would detect every single anomaly. Right? Uh, it would detect every anomaly as soon as possible. So if two algorithms detect the same anomaly, the one that detected it earlier should get preference. Um, it should provide the detections in real time. So that means no look ahead. You have to, as you're getting the data, you have to be able to give a decision. Um, the ideal detector would have no false positives. Um, and one thing that's really important in streaming analytics is you're dealing with thousands of metrics, uh, a pretty large uh, deployments often, and you cannot have para manual parameter tuning. You know, you can't ship a machine learning person with every uh, sensor. So whatever is done has to be done automatically. Uh, the last thing is that cha statistics change all the time in streaming data. And so you have to be able to automatically adapt to changing statistics. And the scoring mechanism should take all that into account. Um, and storing mechani uh, scoring mechanisms in traditional benchmarks are completely insufficient for this. So the standard uh, notions of precision and recall that we're familiar with, they don't incorporate the notion of early detection. Um, there's often an artificial separation between training and test sets, which makes sort of things like continuous learning really hard uh, to measure. Um, and then batch data files allow look ahead and multiple passes through the data. Well, you just can't do that in real-time streaming cases. You've given the data that you have and you have to make a, a decision before you move on. So let's look at an example here of how we score it. So here's a, a metric and it was, there was an anom anomaly that was uh, labeled there right at the bottom. Um, but if you think about it, where exactly is the anomaly? Um, it's probably there was something happened in the, in, the, in the system that caused the metric to slowly start falling and then spike down. So ideally what you want to do is detect the anomaly as soon as that happened. Um, on the other hand, if you can't do that, anywhere in the middle is fine too. That's better than not detecting it. So what we do in NAB is we define what we call anomaly windows. So we have a very generous window that's around each anomaly. And the idea is that the earlier you detect the anomaly in the window, the better your score is going to be. So we've defined a scoring function. Um, so we look at every single detection that your algorithm does. And the effect of each detection is scaled relative to a position within this window. So we use a sigmo sigmoidal uh, scaling function uh, within the window. Detections that are outside the window are considered false positives, and this is automatically handled in the scaling function. It just goes negative as you get really far from the window. 
And then what we do is that if you have multiple detections within a window, we ignore all of them except the very first one. And the idea here is that within a window, there's lots of unusual things probably going on. We're going to give the algorithm uh, the benefit of the doubt and just pick the earliest one and use that as your detection. Okay. And then the complete score for the data set is basically the sum of all of these scale detections. And then we also count all of your false negatives. So if there are any windows for which there are no detections, those are, that's a false negative. So we count up all of them uh, and add in a, a, a scaled uh, a variable. Okay, so that's the scoring function. A couple of other details. Uh, we've defined a notion of uh, application profiles. So the idea behind this is that um, what is uh, the effect of a false positive or the importance of a false positive versus a false negative really depends on your application. Uh, so if you think about like heart patients again and EKG, EKG data, it's okay to have a few false positives, but you really don't want to have a false negative. That would be very bad. On the other hand, uh, if you're in IT or in DevOps, if you work with those folks, they really hate false positives. They're going to get called at 2, 2 a.m., get woken up. They really, if there's too many false positives, they'll just uh, turn off the alarm. So in that case, false positives are really bad. They're actually okay with a few false negatives because usually uh, systems are fairly robust to individual server failures and, and so on. So the exact ratio here really depends on the application. So what we did is we created a system where you can kind of design what those weights are. Uh, NAB comes with three application profiles. There's a standard one that kind of equally weights those two. There's one that favors low false positives, and there's one that kind of favors low false negatives. But you can kind of tune it if you want to really understand the impact of that. Uh, a couple other details. Um, in NAB, we really want to make sure that we emulate a real-time practical application scenario. So when you run an application, an algorithm, you are not allowed to look ahead. Uh, detections must be made on the fly as you go. Okay. Um, there's no separation between training and test sets. Every metric is independent. So what we do is we invoke a model, we start streaming the data to that detector, and you're supposed to uh, detect anomalies as you go. And that reflects uh, real scenarios. Um, Another really important thing is that there should be no batch per data set parameter tuning. You can tune parameters overall, but it must be uh, a, a, you know, the same set of parameters that are used for all the metrics. If you do any parameter tuning, it must be automated and done on the fly. Okay, again, this reflects practical scenarios. Now, if you've deployed machine learning algorithms, you know these are, this is pretty tough criteria. It is hard to do that in, in practice, but that's what the world is. Okay, so we've tested uh, a couple of different algorithms with NAB just to seed it. Uh, the thing to remember is NAB is a community effort. It's open. Uh, the goal, our goal is to have uh, researchers independently evaluate a large number of algorithms. Uh, we want to uh, spur the industry to focus on streaming analytics. Um, and so we designed it so it's very easy to plug in and, and test new algorithms regardless of the programming language or, or scenario. And all of that's kind of documented in the NAB repository. What I'll show is some seed results uh, with three different algorithms. So there's hierarchical temporal memory, which is our algorithm, and we've been uh, working on streaming an anomaly detection for a while. Uh, HTMs model temporal sequences in data, and they're continuously learning. Um, we also tested Etsy Skyline. This is a very popular open source anomaly detection technique. Uh, it uses a mixture of statistical experts and is also continuously learning. Uh, Twitter released an uh, anomaly detection algorithm early this year and also made it open source, so we have that. Um, and they, what they do is try to do robust outlier statistics, and they also do a little bit of piecewise approximation to get a sense of temporal sequences. Okay, so those are the three algorithms that we tried. Um, and this, you know, uh, we were happy to see, perhaps not a surprise, that HTMs is really well on this uh, particular data set uh, on this uh, benchmark against these other two algorithms. So what we think to look at here is that the perfect detector gets a score of 100, so we scaled it uh, to be that way. Numenta gets about 64 on the standard uh, application profile. Twitter is a little bit worse, and then Skyline was the, the worst. All three are quite a bit better than Chance, which is at 16.8. Now, there's none of these detectors are perfect. This is a hard data set, and there's quite a room, a lot of room between the performance of the Nementa detector and Perfect. So there's a lot of room here to still to innovate in there. Okay. Um, what's interesting is uh, looking through some of the results, you get some insights into some of the challenges here. 
Uh, so here's an example um, data set, which is CPU usage on another production server. Uh, there are two anomalies here. On the left, there's a, a very easy spike anomaly, all three algorithms detected. On the right-hand side, there is a shift in the CPU usage. Again, perhaps some, there was some configuration change on the server or a new software was installed, we don't know. But all of a sudden, the CPU usage goes higher. Um, so what happens is, in this case, the HTM and Skyline both detect that. So HTM here is in, in a diamond and the Skyline is a, as a square. Um, Twitter actually doesn't detect that until much later. But you'll see that this new usage is now the new normal. In the case of Twitter, they keep giving false positives for quite a while. Skyline actually does really well. There's no false positives afterwards. Uh, the Numenta detector does give a couple of false positives afterwards and then adapts to this new normal. So the Skyline actually worked best on, the, on this data set. Here's another one, which is the, the machine temperature scenario. Um, there are two, focusing on the last two anomalies. Um, all three of them detect the catastrophic failure. Only the Numenta HTM detector detects that a temporal anomaly. This is not a surprise because uh, the HTM actually looks at the temporal sequences, not just um, in IID statistics. In this case, uh, HTM gives one false positive and, uh, and uh, Skyline gives another false positive in the middle. And there are no false positives from, uh, from Twitter. And here's a third example. Um, and this is something really interesting we found in a lot of these data sets is that when you look at an anomaly, there's often a very you know, marked change in an anomaly, like a spike. But if you look closely, there's often a subtle shift that precedes that, uh, that, that big spike. So this is an example of that. And in this case, Skyline and Twitter both detect the, the spike, but the HTM, because it's looking at temporal sequences, detect this, detects that sub, uh, you know, subtle shift. This is really hard to do with, uh, if you're just looking at outliers and statistics. It's very hard to detect that subtle shift without getting a lot of false positives. And you know, so you really need to look at temporal changes and temporal sequences in order to do well with uh, streaming analytics. Okay, so in summary, um, anomaly detection we feel is the most common current application in streaming analytics. Uh, so NAB is a community benchmark for streaming anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. It includes a comprehensive labeled data set with real data. Uh, we have a scoring methodology that's designed for practical real-time applications uh, and a fully open source code base. Kind of looking ahead, uh, you know, we've seeded this with a few algorithms, but we really hope to see researchers test a lot of other algorithms and we really hope to see more focus on the world of streaming analytics from the machine learning community. Uh, we hope to spark improved algorithms for streaming. Um, and for version two, we'd love to get more data sets. I know many of you have data sets. Please come uh, contact us if, you, if you're willing to donate the data set. Uh, we want to get data set with labeled anomalies in there. And uh, if you're a machine learning practitioner, you know that's, that's gold. Um, there's a possibility of incorporating some from UC Irvine. They have some uh, nice streaming data sets that we could incorporate. Uh, Yahoo Labs released a streaming data set earlier. Unfortunately, it's not currently open yet, so we can't incorporate it. But uh, if they do make it open, then uh, we'd be able to do that. And uh, currently, you know, there's a lot more features we can add to NAB as well. So for example, currently, it's a, the, the, the metrics are a single metric, scalar metric value plus a timestamp. Uh, so one possible extension of NAB is to include multivariate anomaly detection. Again, this is dependent on us getting good data sets, but that's another. Uh, we want to add additional features to NAB as well over time. <coughs> Okay, finally, uh, here are some resources. Uh, we do have a table and we're more than happy to uh, answer your questions and have you participate in this. Um, the, the URL for the repository is up there. Uh, there's a paper that's uh, gonna appear in IEEE ICMLA in December um, uh, with Alex Labin and myself. Um, there's, the link to that is on the NAB repository, but the PDF of that is up in archive. Um, and then there's our contact info over there. Thank you.